Mary Poppins would probably have to be on my top five favorite Disney movies of all time. And I know that sounds really weird, um, and it's true, I, it is up there um, due to its obscurity. You know, you don't really think of Mary Poppins when you think of Disney movies, at least right away. You know, you always think of, you know, the classic princess animated films or, you know, even the Disney Pixar ones nowadays. Um, but, no, it's, it still has that charm to it, and, you know, the music's great, I love the music as a kid and even now. Um, the Sherman Brothers are great, um, they did, uh, Jungle Book, um, I think they did Pete's Dragon, I'm not sure. They also did Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, um, you know, just, just great music, you know, silly sometimes, but also just very beautiful at other times. Um, also, I mean, Julie Andrews was a hottie back then. I, Come on, <laughs> you know, that is one of the reasons why I like it, I won't lie. Also, I love Dick Van Dyke. Say what you want about, you know, his cognitive accent. I, you know, good accents aren't a big deal to me <laughs> um, when it comes to acting. Um, case in point, I still really like Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. <laughs> um, but also, it, it has the this, this sign of a great kids movie which is, you could watch it as a kid, enjoy it for its silly things or, you know, whatever, and then you could watch it as an adult and still take something from it. You know, the music I liked as a kid, I still like it as an adult. And, you know, even some, you know, some of the more serious scenes really speak to me more, you know, just the cinematography of it speaks to me more. It's a very well-made movie. So Saving Mr. Banks. Um, is about, you know, the short synopsis of it, it's about the making of Mary Poppins when Walt Disney um, uh, worked with P.L. Travers, the British woman who wrote it, um, and, you know, made it into the movie we all know and love, at least I do. <laughs> um, P.L. Travers, um, so I didn't even know that it w was a book, but I assumed, you know, it was a book originally, um, because it's Disney, you know, they love doing that. Uh, and. It's it's more about her. Um, it it's a biopic about her life as a child and her relationship with her father, and also a biopic about the making of this movie. It it goes back and forth. Um, it uh, that's that's the short synopsis. Like I said, the um, the longer synopsis is Saving Mr. Banks is a movie about how adaptations should be handled. At least this is my wild, you know, out there opinion. But watching it and the fact that it's coming out in a time where, you know, there's so many adaptations coming out, and I know it's always been a thing, you know, adaptations since the beginning of Hollywood have always been a thing. But I mean, more so now than today, and back then they were good. You know, today they just don't care as much, you know, because they sell, regardless of what you do. If people like the books, they're going to see it. You know, if people want to read the books, they're going to go see it. Um, so I, I feel like adaptations are kind of a, you know, a failing art, um, or they have been for a long time. And I feel like this movie, like the fact that it came out, you know, around this time, is kind of a statement towards this is how adaptations should be treated. You know, this is how authors should treat their own works. This is how movie producers, you know, this is, you know, how they should respect, you know, these other people's works. Because it's very much, you know, obviously, because there has to be conflict, there is very much so conflict between Travers and Walt Disney in the collaboration, because she holds her stories, her, you know, the Mary Poppins story very dear to her. It's very personal. She created it. You know, authors should give a shit about what they write. She was harassed by the Disney company for 20 years, apparently, you know, of them just constantly, year after year, just being like, hey, can we make this, you know, movie based on your book, please, you know? And she, you know, is very much against it for one reason or another, but, you know, she one of the main reasons is she just doesn't want to sell her soul, you know, sell this piece of property of hers that she holds dear, like I said. That's how writers should treat their their own work, <laughs> you know? that's the, They should care, you know? And she finally agrees, but under these extreme terms, um, I assume it's true, because it's based on, you know, the real making of the film, but they would even have the rights during pre-production. You know, they're writing the script, they're writing music, they're paying all these people, they're paying designers and animators and stuff to, you know, concept art and everything, and 
they didn't even have the rights yet. They didn't even know if she was going to give up the rights yet. You know, they spent all this money but still don't know. You know, that's, you know, that's a pretty powerful statement on, you know, adaptations. You know, like, that's how much she cared. That's how much the, you know, the studio should, that's how much Walt showed respect for her work. You know, we're not going to, you know, make you sign your soul, you know, sell your soul and, until, you know, you're satisfied, basically. Even though, Obviously, like, Walt is very much, much against this, <laughs> you know, it happens, but, you know, I, it's, it's, it's not smart business to do that, and I'm, you know, I'm not saying that's how adaptation should go, the, you know, the writer, the owner of the, the book should, you know, hold on to the rights while they're, you know, coming up with ideas and spending all this money on making it and everything, but, you know, that's, it's still really important, you know, to show that, you know, they care, they listened, you know, she gives her opinions and everything, and they listen to them, uh, kind of, because <laughs> um, it's interesting in the movie, she's very much against everything that you know is in the movie, um, you know, she mentions she doesn't want uh, Mary Poppins and um, Bert, Dick Van Dyke's character, to have any hint of a romance, which they kind of do in the movie, um, she oh, what was one of the other things. She didn't want animations. She didn't want dancing penguins, you know, cartoon penguins. But there's cartoon penguins in the movie. Um, she didn't want Mr. Banks to have a mustache, but he has a mustache in the movie. So it's you know really interesting that you know throughout this whole movie, you know, if you've seen Mary Poppins, you know what actually comes, you know, what the final product was. But she's naysaying all of it, you know. So you're like it. It, it's kind of, you know, it doesn't really give it away, though, you know, that she gives in because you don't know how, you don't know why, you know, because she's very bitter about the whole thing, and in some cases it seems like she's doing it on purpose just to, you know, shut the film down, you know. There's a point where she says she's very much against the color red. She doesn't want the color red in the movie at all. You know, like, that seems kind of silly, um, you know, there's... It cuts back and forth between, you know, her past life with her father and, you know, the, t you know, making this movie and everything, the, the present, so to speak, and her past. And, um, you know, after she says she doesn't want the color red, shortly there's a scene where her dad, who, you know, gets very ill, um, is coughing up blood and she sees it. So it kind of says, oh, this is why she doesn't want the color red, but that's a bit extreme, you know? So still, it kind of seems like, you know, she, she has this idea in her head, oh, you know, how about no color red, see if they still want to make this film, you know? Because, again, she's, it, there's this inner struggle with her, and, you know, it's good. I, again, it's how adaptations should be done, you know, how they should be handled. The author should, you know, say, hey, this is my creation, I gave a lot of thought into this, you know, I gave myself into this, I don't want to just, you know, throw it away for money, you know, to make this horrible movie that, you know, just, you know, give it, give it into someone else's hands and have them do whatever they want with it, you know, that's not what she wanted to do, and I don't think that's what anybody should want to do with their own work. That's just my rant, though. <laughs> um, you know, the movie's a biopic, like I said, it's, you know, biopics have their their inner themes, and you take from it what you want. This one's also very much about father relationships, um, without spoiling too much, uh, again, it's a biopic, but, you know, there's still some things that, it, how they pace it, and how they show it, and when they show it, is very powerful, and then one of the things is relationships with, you know, your fathers, and legacies, keeping legacies, um, one of the things, you know, she didn't want her father to be seen in a bad light, and her father, I guess, is very much Mr. Banks in the book, and in the movie, supposedly. The father, in her flashbacks, um, P.L. Travers, when she's a little kid, and the relationship with her father, um, is played by Colin Farrell, interestingly enough. Um, I, yeah, I, just thought that was strange. <laughs> um, but no, speaking of actors, the actors in it, uh, Tom Hanks is Walt Disney. Obviously a thing I need to bring up because, uh, you know, it, I could see it, how a lot of people say, you know, it works, you know, it makes total sense. Um, it does. He's very charismatic. Uh, he, you know, it, it portrays that child at heart without it being creepy, you know, in a, in a sense. Um, my only gripe was with P.L. Travers, too, played by Emma Thompson. When does she not play a writer? I don't know. <laughs> um, they don't look like 
themselves. You know, again, this might just be a gripe of mine, but Tom Hanks look like, looks like a younger Walt Disney, not the Walt Disney that was there, you know, when all this was actually happening. Um, he was a lot wrinklier. <laughs> so was P.L. Travers, apparently. I've never seen a picture of her before. But at the end of the movie, um, during the end credits, they show photos of, you know, I, the premiere of Mary Poppins and stuff, because she was there, Walt was there, and everything. So it shows all these photos of them and stuff. You know, really them. And it looks nothing like either of them, you know? And it's funny, because it's like, you know, imagine somebody going in not knowing who Walt Disney is and seeing those pictures. It's like, who's that guy? Is that, you know, is that Tom Hanks? Is that supposed to be Emma Thompson? Like, you know, I don't get it. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, you know, he, he looks like the younger version, you know, and Emma Thompson looks nothing like the author, or at least not at the time again. You know, maybe it was what she looked like when she was younger. You know, maybe again, Emma Thompson apparently is good at playing a writer. <laughs> so they're like, oh, British writer, Emma Thompson. Um... Paul Giamatti is in this film, and it's funny how they bring him up because uh, he's uh, her chauffeur when she goes to Hollywood. You know, he drives her around in this uh, car, limo, no, I don't remember, a fancy car, he drives her around. Um, but he's the chauffeur, and so when he shows up in the seat, you know, she flies into Hollywood and he's there with the sign. I'm just like, well, that's Paul Giamatti, how, why is he such a small role? He isn't, <laughs> you know, and so I just kind of gave it away for myself. I was like, oh, I know that actor, so obviously he's gonna, he should be a bigger part, and he is. Um, and again, I made this argument with Rush, too, um, about, you know, movies based on real life. I want to know, because in the film, they portray this relationship between Travers and Paul Giamatti as a chauffeur. Like, it's this really awesome relationship between the two of them. You know, he's like the... She she comes to America bitter, you know, not wanting to agree with anything, you know, just hating everything about America and everybody in America. Um, mostly the Disney company. You know, not just... She doesn't come and be like, ah, America, that, you know. Very much against, you know, she's she talks crap about L.A. and stuff, you know, a lot. And Paul Giamatti, the chauffeur, is like the first person who, you know, she kind of warms up to. You know, she kind of, you know, has a connection with him because he's very nice to her and he's constantly just like trying to get her to open up and stuff. And eventually it finally happens and they become really close friends. Does that happen in real life? I don't know. I want to know. Is this, was this a thing? <laughs> you know, did she, was she friends with her chauffeur when she was in, um, L.A.? Like, it... It's, I hate that, <laughs> you know, because I want to enjoy it, but I don't want to enjoy it if it was just there to, you know, bring some Disney magic into the film or something, you know, make it more lighthearted because it's quite a depressing movie, actually. One of my issues with this movie is there's so many main characters in this film. Um, you know, you have Travers, obviously, because it's all, you know, it goes about her life, her struggles with, you know, selling her life, you know, her, you know, this these deep feelings and stuff that she put into this book, selling it to Hollywood, you know, um, very much about Walt Disney too, um, cause he's, he's very much a protagonist, he has these struggles, you know, he's not as much an antagonist, you know, he's also there, you know, trying to, you know, achieve a goal, you know, trying to not just make this movie happen, but kind of win Traverse over, you know, just kind of to get her to open up to him, um, and uh, then you have her father, who, you know, the struggling, you know, man who, again, has, has his own conflicts. You know, he drinks a lot. He's trying to be a good father, but is really terrible at, you know, bits and pieces of it. Um, and then you have, you know, obviously you have Mary Poppins, because she's mentioned so much in this movie as kind of like this godlike figure, you know, this omnipresent being. You know, like, they talk about Mary Poppins, like, she is, she is it, you know, that's, she is the one, she is everything that's gonna make anything, everything good, you know, in, in the, you know, the present scenes where they're making the movie, you know, like, Mary Poppins is, you know, what they're trying to achieve, what they're trying to, you know, make perfect, you know, in the exact right image, and everything. So Mary Poppins is very much a character, but kind of, you know, as a, you know, 
kind of like Aslan from Chronicles of Narnia, you know? Like, before you even see him, he's talked about a lot, so he's very much a character even before he shows up, you know? That's how Mary Poppins is in this movie. You know, she's the one thing everybody's talking about. And then you have... So you have all these characters, but then you have the actual nanny who shows up, and she's only in, like, two scenes. You know, she comes in, you know, kind of just you know, hardcore clamps down on just keeping everything organized within their household, you know, just keeping everything clean, you know, she's leaving the duties to her and her sister, um, you know, cleaning duties and stuff and all this stuff, um, very much like what Mary Poppins does in the movie with the kids, you know, she shows up and is immediately like, this is what we need to do, this is how we make things work better, you know. So she shows up and does that, and then she shows up again in the flashback when her father dies. Um, Traverse, uh, she, you know, comes into her father's room. It, like, she, the nanny comes out because she was taking care of him. You know, he's dead. She, you know, Traverse runs in and, you know, gets all sad and everything. And she turns to the nanny and says, you're supposed to fix everything. You know, you're supposed to come here and make everything better. And then she runs off. And that's the last you hear of the nanny. You know, like, on a bad note. You know, so it's like, but this is... You know, this nanny is supposed to be the inspiration for this, you know, godlike figure that's going on in the present, you know, but it doesn't really work because they underplay the nanny so much and they make the nanny seem like it, she wasn't that big deal. You know, and seeing the previews and going to see the movie and not knowing about Travers's past life, I was just under the impression, oh, the nanny, you know, when the nanny shows up, you know, things just, you know, there's this inspiration, you know, she, you know, basically makes Travers into this whole new person you know, changes her life forever, but no, the nanny is just kind of, eh, there, <laughs> you know, so I thought that was really weird, and it, again, it, I feel like it might be because they just had so many characters to, you know, to talk about, to, you know, have a story revolve around, you know, so many people to talk about, so many conflicts and everything to portray that the nanny just, you know, kind of got underplayed, that's just my opinion, um, but again, it wouldn't make sense to have, you know, the dad seems like more of the, you know, big character than Mary Poppins, which makes sense because uh, the movie's called Saving Mr. Banks. You know, Mr. Banks is the dad in the Mary Poppins movie. Um, oh, yeah, um, I forgot. The Sherman Brothers are in this movie, played by B.J. Novak and uh, Jason Schwartzman. Amazing. I'm so happy about that because Jason Schwartzman is awesome. <laughs> I love him. And he plays one of the Sherman Brothers. I love the Sherman Brothers. It's it's perfect, you know? It's so awesome seeing him playing piano and singing one of their songs. A Mary Poppins song. Jason Schwartzman singing a Mary Poppins song. What? <laughs> you know? It's it's mind-blowing. Um, one of the things I want to bring up, actually, B.J. Novak. I can't remember which Sherman brother he was. Richard? Is there a Richard Sherman? I don't remember now what their names were. But he walks with a cane and a limp, and at one point Travers asks, you know, what happened to him, and Jason Schwartzman says, oh, he got shot. I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's, a, you know, I look it up and, you know, but, it, you know, one of those, I don't know, it was weird to me because it blew my mind. I was like, oh, he got shot. I didn't know that. Um, oh, I got to go into music, too. The music of this movie, um, besides the Sherman Brothers, like, they actually play, you know, music from the film, um, which is awesome, because a lot of times it's, you know, acted out, played out, very much like in the movie, um, but the actual background music was done by Thomas Newman, um, and I knew it right away, because Thomas Newman did the score for American Beauty, and one of the very first, the first time they go into the writing room, to go through this, go through the script. The first day they go through the script together, um, with Traverse and the scriptwriter and the Sherman Brothers are there too. First time they do that, this music is playing in the background. I'm like, this sounds like American Beauty. Like it's almost exactly from <laughs> the movie American Beauty. It's weird, um, but uh, yeah. So sure enough, Thomas Newman, um, and it's it's interesting because he's always been criticized as you know kind of underplaying his themes. You know, it doesn't add anything to the film, you know, it doesn't, 
it doesn't convey any sort of emotions or anything like a lot of composers do. Not a bad thing, especially in this case because, again, it's a Disney movie, you have the Sherman Brothers playing music, why would you need to write your own score, basically, you know? It's, it's so full of all these other musical numbers. There's also a lot of um, f uh, songs going on, like when she's being taken around the Disney studio, um, there's like this piano, jazz piano rendition of um, Whistle While You Work? Great, I don't remember what the song was, but you know, this, you know, covers of, or, you know, uh, other Disney songs, you know, from other movies, you know, like these jazz, you know, piano covers, and I thought that was really cool too. There's a lot of scenes in this movie, and it's beautiful. Um, where present and past um, in her childhood, they juxtaposed with the movie, the Mary Poppins movie. Um, again, it's probably one of the greatest things about this movie is, you know, if you've seen Mary Poppins and you see this, you know, the comparisons between the scenes in that movie and the scenes, you know, during the making of this movie and in, you know, her past, um, it's, there's one scene, um, the Feed the Birds scene, which is, one of my favorite songs from the movie, um, you know, it's very, very beautiful, you know, kind of depressing melody, you know, a song about a woman who, you know, is down on her luck, but she still only wants the simple things, you know, she feeds birds, that's, that's what she does, you know, she asks very little in life. Um, and, uh, so there's a scene where, you know, Walt Disney is struggling with Travers, you know, because she's just not agreeing with anything, and he's not, you know, they can't get anything done. He can't, you know, he can't, uh, you know, get to her in any way. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds bad. He can't um, win her over, you know, he can't get her to open up. Um, and so there's a scene where he's at the studio at night, and he's sitting on this bench outside, and you hear um, Feed the Birds playing on piano and very distantly, and so he looks behind him and it's, you know, the, the pre-writing room where the Sherman Brothers also are, you know, writing their songs, and, you know, you see him walk in and, you know, Sedation Schwartzman is playing the song on piano and singing it and stuff, and Disney's just kind of sitting there watching him. Really cool scene to me personally, because <laughs> um, I love that song, it's just kind of a cool moment where, you know, you have the Sherman Brothers just kind of, you know, still working, and Walt Disney just you know, just kind of hanging around the studio, just thinking about what he should do, you know. And even better, um, after that, um, he plays that, they have this talk or something, and um, Sher the, Jason Schwartzman starts playing um, this, other, this other song that he wrote recently, you know, like one of the newer songs that they're going to add to, you know, the film, if it even gets made at this point, you know. Um, and it's... I can't remember what, when it happens in the movie, but Mr. Banks sings it. Um, it's, it's kind of a motif of um, a song he sings earlier, um, but it's a lot more, you know, somber because he's kind of just beaten by this point. I'm pretty sure it's after the chimney sweeps just ran through his house and Bert's still hanging around and Mr. Banks is singing the song about, you know, how she, Mary Pops just kind of came in and, you know, Things were all organized and perfect, and when she showed up, just chaos, you know, his life completely turned upside down, you know, just by her, you know, entrance, you know, and everything, just by her showing up in his life. And, um, so Walt Disney laughs, and he's like, is this inspired by somebody? And, you know, I'm just like, oh, that, obviously, that song is about P.L. Travers, you know? It's the exact same thing, how she came into their studio, you know, they, you know, had you know they have this system where they make these movies and everything but then she showed up and everything just got all crazy you know like just nothing turned out right you know what they're comfortable in you know they was taken away um and then i realized walt disney is mr banks and peel Travers is mary poppins you know in this one brief scene like that's totally what the relation is you know, you have this, you know, you, you have this guy with a mustache, <laughs> this dad with a mustache who just wants things to be his way, and then this British woman who just kind of flies in and, you know, just tears it all to pieces, you know. Um, so I thought that was really cool, you know, this is, there's this awesome relationship between this film and the Mary Poppins movie. Um, there's another really cool one, um, the Banks song, when, uh, 
the dad takes Michael to the bank in the Mary Poppins movie um, to you know, open an account, I believe, you know, to give it up his, you know, money to start, a, you know, to, to start an account. And, you know, the dad and all these other bank workers and the owner is like, you know, surrounding him and they sing this song, you know, very forceful, you know, marching tune about the importance of banks and how it's good to give up your money to the bank and everything, but Michael doesn't want to and everything. Um, during that song, it actually cuts back because they're in the writing room P.L. Travers is there she's just kind of like staring out on the space in the window and while they're playing the song for her she recalls back to when her dad who ran the bank um, where they lived was giving the speech about the bank you know he's speaking for the bank you know and everything and he was giving the speech in front of all these people and he was drunk at the time that was you know one of the things, you know, he was a drinker, her dad was. And so he's drunk when he's giving the speech and he's just, you know, making these, you know, outlandish, you know, boisterous statements about the bank and it is the exact same things that they say in the song. And so it's really cool because it cuts back between Colin Farrell, you know, just drunkenly, you know, shouting about how great banks are and, you know, Peel Travers is in this room with the Sherman Brothers, you know, playing this piano song saying the exact same stuff, you know. Um, it's really cool because I love that song too because the song, again, it's this marching tune and it always seems like it's going to build into something, you know, it's like, it's you know, it builds and builds and it's going to like, you know, explode, <laughs> you know, like something awful is going to happen when the song's over, um, which kind of does in the movie because Michael runs off. Um, and uh, I think, man, I haven't seen Mary Poppins in a while actually. So, but anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's one of the greater things about this film. Um, again, though, you'd have to watch Mary Poppins and know Mary Poppins well to, you know, see that, to appreciate, you know, that relation. Um, but it's just really well done, you know. It's like, it's, it's what I would have expected going into, and they did it, you know. I want them to use the music to, you know, to actually play the music and use it in, you know, a clever context, and they do. Um, uh, before I, I wrap this whole ramble fest up, um, another thing that I thought was really fascinating with this movie was it's it has these really subtle, you know, things just like crammed into the backgrounds, um, specifically for Walt Disney. Um, now, in this movie, it's very much more Traverse's story than it is Di Walt Disney's story, um, even though he's very much a you know main character in it. But they don't complete his arc, so to speak. Um, you know, he wants to get what he wants. You know, he you know he wants to win Traverse over. He does, and he gets what you know. It's, just, it, it's very little building of him. Um, but because we should already know, you know, who Walt Disney is, right? And we already know the movie happens, so it's not so much a big of a deal as you know Traverse's inner, you know, workings and stuff. <clears throat> but. They very much uh, hint towards his death. Um, it's really weird because <laughs> uh, he died of lung cancer, I believe. Um, he died of some sort of cancer, and it was probably caused by his smoking. He smoked a lot of cigars. Um, and it shows in this movie, and they don't really build up onto any of it. They don't say anything about Walt Disney's death, but they sure hint towards it a lot. And it's just so bizarre, because um, whenever Walt Disney makes a presence, like the, before, the first time you see him, he's about to, you know, Travers is about to meet him and everything. Before he even comes on screen, you hear this, like, hacking cough, you know, this awful smoker's cough. You know, then he shows up. And this happens so many times, where before Walt Disney even enters the scene, you hear this cough. Um, there's a scene where he calls her on her hotel phone. And she answers, but before he even says anything, you hear this cough out of the phone, and then it cuts to him on the phone, and he's talking to her. You know, and they don't say anything, you know, not even in the credits. They don't say, oh, Walt died at this year from lung cancer or whatever, you know. They don't, they don't say why they're showing this so much, you know. They don't, they're not explaining why they, you know, went through the trouble of showing you you know, they show you him smoking a cigar, um, which apparently he hid from most of his employees. There's this part where, I think when she learns about the dancing cartoon penguins, she 
bursts into Walt Disney's office and the whole time her, his secretaries are like, no, 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 he's busy right now, you can't go see him. But he comes in anyway and he's, you know, he's putting out a cigar. And he says, you know, I don't want, want people seeing me do bad habits. Again, you know, there's no point for that scene to exist because they don't, they don't finish that thought. You know, they don't end that story with his death, but it's there. Um, also, interestingly enough, before the premiere, um, she shows up to his office again, and in the background, blurry from, you know, the, the aspect ratio, or whatever it's called, wow, I just botched that, um, two years of film school, but you see blurry in the background when Walt Disney is talking, this map of Florida. Before Walt Disney died, he was working on Walt Disney World in Florida. You know, it's just like, again, they didn't need to put that in there, but they did. You know, this hint towards, you know, some other Disney product that has nothing to do with what's going on in the movie. Really bizarre stuff. Um, but, you know, you appreciate it if you know, you know, because I knew that, you know, I knew about the whole Walt Disney World thing in Florida, so the map made sense. You know, I knew about, you know, his inevitable death from cancer, you know, so I understood the coughing. But, you know, if you don't, then... The, None of it makes sense, you know, none of it's important if you don't know about any of that, if you don't, you know, never, you know, think to look any of that up. Um, so really interesting stuff. Um, but again, uh, to finish this, um, Saving Mr. Banks, very good movie. Um, I personally liked it, um, but I think that even if you know nothing about Mary Poppins and nothing about Disney, for some odd reason, um, you'd still enjoy it, um, because if anything, again, it's, you know, this tale about, you know, really deep characters, you know, people who had these, you know, really personal issues, you know, these really, um, you know, interesting conflicts, you know, that are, you know, it's interesting, it's a, it's an interest, interesting story, um, you know, but I, I imagine you'd like it more if you, you know, one, liked Mary Poppins, which I did, um, and two, you know, just like anything Disney, you know, and knew who Walt Disney was and everything. Um, so, uh, for me personally, though, um, you know, that aside, like, I'm just gonna rate this on my personal thoughts. I give it five kites out of five. So, I mean, if you don't like it, you can go fly a kite.